So this, um, this talks about something that I'm sure you've heard about before, and that is the idea that the language that you speak shapes the way you see the world. This is the language as thought hypothesis. It goes under various names, and we'll see a few of them. But the basic idea is one that's very attractive. You can learn about it in an anthropology class. You can learn about it in a sociology class. Psychology, you're definitely going to come by it. In linguistics classes, it's often taught, partly because it's a great way to get a class going. And the basic idea is that the way your language <coughs> organizes words, the way your language's grammar happens to work, shapes how you think. It's not that anybody's saying that you can't have the other kinds of thoughts, but the idea is that to speak Spanish is to perceive the world in a different way than it is to speak English. Not because of being a Spanish person culturally, whatever that means, and we'll get into the whole notion of how squishy that gets, but because of the way Spanish is built as a language in contrast to English, or German, or Russian, or Chinese, or what have you. This idea is very popular. Various books have been written about it for the general public that are often very well received about once a year. There will probably be an editorial in the New York Times that takes the position that your language channels how you think and it elicits warm responses. And the fact is that it really isn't true that the language that you speak channels the way that you think. It isn't true, by extension, and this is where that whole idea gets really interesting, it isn't true that the way your language is built is what shapes your culture or that it corresponds to your culture. Burmese language has nothing to do with being a Burmese person. It seems like it would, and you almost want it to, for various reasons that I will also get into. Don't worry, this talk won't be that long, but there's some things that we need to touch on. <coughs> you know, it's not true. It's just not true. And I can't speak for anthropologists and psychologists, but I can speak for linguists. Most linguists know that it's not true. It's something that we talk about over a glass of wine or something like that, but we have tended to let it pass for various reasons. But I think that this hoax of an idea gets in the way of really engaging with what a language is. I think that there are some dangerous consequences of it that we tend not to learn about. I think that the whole idea that your language is your thoughts is actually more pernicious than it is beneficial. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, so I want to make I want to make my case. But first, we have to familiarize ourselves with what the basic idea is. Benjamin Lee Worf was the person who first popularized this idea starting in the 1930s. That's a long time ago now. This idea has been presented as an open question now for the better part of, of 100 years. It started with Benjamin Lee Worf in the 30s. Now he actually was a fire inspector. He, he wasn't actually a linguist. But that doesn't mean that he was wrong on the basis of that. Often, for somebody to think out of the box, they have to come from outside. But he was a fire inspector who had made a study of the Hopi language, Hopi Native Americans. And he wrote a very influential series of texts. He also was a good public speaker, apparently, so this idea took hold. And so typical quotes would include something like this one, users of markedly different grammars are pointed by the grammars toward different types of observations and different evaluations of externally similar acts of observation, and hence are not equivalent as observers, but must arrive at somewhat different views of the world. Now that's a little wordy, but this puts it more bluntly. He said, we cut nature up, organize it into concepts, and ascribe significances as we do, largely because we're parties to an agreement to organize it in this way an agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of our language. So, he said, the agreement is, of course, an implicit and unstated one, but its terms are absolutely obligatory. We can't talk at all except by subscribing to the organization and 
classification of data which the argument agreement decrees. So, he put it in those ways, and that is a spellbinding kind of writing, but what he means is something like this. If any of us have dabbled in languages other than English, then we're probably familiar with that difference that you find in many Western European languages in particular, and that is different ways of knowing it. So in French, connaître is to know something in the sense of a person, savoir was to know something in the sense of a fact. Now, if Worf's way of looking at these things, and that's why this way of looking at things is sometimes called Worfianism, because his name was Worf. If Worfianism is true, then that means that if you speak French, or if you speak Spanish with Saber and Conocer, or if you speak German with Wissen and Kennen, then it means that to you, in your mind, the difference between knowing your neighbor and knowing that 2 plus 2 is 4 is more prominent in your mind. It's part of your thought pattern in a more vivid way than it is, for example, for me, because my native language is English, and for me, both of those things are just knowing. So Mark Abley is a fine journalist who wrote a very Warfian-influenced book called Spoken Here. Good 10 years ago and change now, but he said, my language allows me somewhat clumsily to get the distinction across, on the one hand, factual knowledge, on the other, acquaintanceship and understanding. But to a French speaker, that distinction is central to how the mind interacts with the world. You might think so, seeing that there is this differentiation, which from English seems peculiar. We just know. You know your neighbor, you know 2 plus 2 equals 4. In these languages, there are different words for that, and so perhaps knowing for them is different. Now, it's a general pattern that people will, you don't have to read Wharf nowadays, you'll hear about it in a class, or you'll read a journalist like Abley. It's just, it's very much in the water. You will learn something like um, Jack Hitt is a journalist who's written pieces for the time. He's writing about a group of South American people called the Coescar. And Coescar is one of many languages that doesn't happen to mark the future the way we're used to in European languages. And so I go, I went, I will go. We figure from English that that's the way any language is, but it isn't. Coescar doesn't happen to do that. Now, Hitt had the idea that the reason that there's no real future in Coescar was because, well, you know, they're always moving around, and so they don't have to think much about the future because they're living in the present. Now, he, he wasn't an anthropologist, he was doing one story, but you might think, okay, if they don't have a future, then it must mean that they don't think about the future, and maybe that makes sense of a small, preliterate, nomadic tribe of people to never think about the future. That's the sort of idea that one gets. Now, this is something that must be known. Does language influence thought? Now, Worf put forth a rather extreme version of the idea, upon which he died. Worf died in the 40s, so he hasn't, hasn't been in the discussion for a very long time. But there are psychologists now who are often called the neo and they are doing further work on this idea. And what they're finding is that, yes, language does influence thought to a degree. So it's not that Worf was anything like an idiot. Of course language influences thought to a degree. Language practically is thought. And the neo-Worfian experiments in themselves are really fascinating reading. It's just what we make of them that has to be discussed further than I think we're often encouraged to. So, for example, it comes with some of the most random things. In English, you talk about something being a long time, and you rarely think about that as being a particular way you might express the duration of time. And that's especially because in Indonesian, you say a long time too. There are languages that do that. In Spanish, you say much time. You could say lengthy time, but it's not idiomatic. You might be understood, but you wouldn't be befriended. It shows you that you're a little off. So, in English, a long time. Spanish, a lot of time. Greek is like that, too. Most of us probably don't know Greek, but that means a lot of time. So languages differ according to that, in itself, utterly boring-looking difference. But what's interesting is, 
If you have a setup on a computer screen, and you've got a square, and you've got the square gradually filling up with black up to the top, and then on the other side of the screen, you have a line that's gradually filling in black and then hitting the other side. Very interesting. If you're somebody who speaks English or Indonesian, you're better at predicting when the black is going to hit the end of the line than when this fluid is going to come up to the top of the square. If you speak Spanish or Greek, you're better at predicting when the fluid is going to go like this than when the black is going to hit the end of the line. Now, that correlates with those languages and others. I only put those two because to put any more than four, and it looks dazzling. But it's found that depending on whether you say a long time or much time, that much more um, consistently than could possibly be due to accident, you are better at either predicting time involving a volume or time involving a length. Now, there couldn't be any reason other than the languages that it pans out that way. Who knew that speaking English meant you'd be better at predicting this than this? But it must be true, because it's also true of people who speak Indonesian. And it obviously isn't cultural. There's nothing about living in Jakarta and Detroit that means that you would be better at predicting something going on with this line and something going on with this cue. It must be the language. That kind of experiment is highly ingenious. That's um, Daniel Casasanto, who's now at the University of Chicago. Or, um, this is actually my favorite one. You can be Japanese, and you can be American. A person could be either one of those things. And it, it has interesting results. Imagine, here's a table. Take some um, Nivea, some droplets, like squat, squat, squat. And then you take a big mess of Nivea and just go blah. And then you get some dippity doo and you go blah. And you put this big clump, not squirts, but a big clump, splop. So little drops of Nivea, big clump of Nivea, and a big clump of dippity doo. I don't really know what dippity doo is. <laughs> something that I think is now obsolete, but it, it was something with hair and it was kind of like Nivea. Anyway, so if you take a bunch of American kids and say which of these two things go together, then you find that they look at the clump of dippity doo and the clump of Nivea and they say those go together, then they're just these little squirts of Nivea. If you take Japanese kids, and these, these results are very robust, take Japanese children, they swarm around, they're yelling and screaming, calm down, okay. How do you group these things? Much, much more than the American kids, it's, well, the Nivea drops and the Nivea clump are the same, and then there's this clump of this other stuff. Now, none of them are thinking about it, nothing is said about language, it's just that Japanese kids go, oh, aha. Uh -huh. American kids go, oh, aha. Uh -huh. And what it means is that the American kids seem to be going more by shape and the Japanese kids more by material. Well, isn't it interesting that in Japanese, you have to think about things like material more. And so, for example, if you say two dogs, you can just look at these. Now, you can kind of tell that two is, is neat. And if you look at the one with beer, you can tell that beer is probably beer, which means that dogs, if all these are kind of akin, dog is inu, and apple, believe it or not, is ringo. Okay, so two dogs is not ni inu. That's not a Japanese sentence. You have to say ni hiki, no inu. Two beers is not ni hiki, no inu. You have to say hon. For apples, it's ko. If any of you are native speakers of Chinese, you were very familiar with a language being built that way. Those are often called numeral classifiers. For those of you who've never heard of that term, forget it. Just notice that that is the way languages like this work. If that's the way your language works, well, that's obviously the key difference between English and Japanese. And isn't it interesting that then they're the ones who have this sensitivity to these two materials as opposed to these two shapes. So there are countless experiments like that that show that language does have an influence on thought. It's in these infinitesimal, blue kinds of ways. 
and the data, the data is in. Anybody who said language has no effect on thought hasn't been doing their reading. And so it comes down to a question like this. Isn't that a worldview? What we're told is that your language shapes your worldview. It shapes your thought patterns, languages, correlate with cultures. Who's to say what a worldview is? So these materials, and you see the Nivea, and you decide that those things go together. That is a view of the world. The Nivea is in the world. I personally think that it's quite insignificant how good somebody is at predicting when a line is going to hit a wall. But that's just me. Maybe I'm just not very athletic. Maybe I don't care about lines. That's a worldview. Maybe if I was looking over a cliff at some water, something. That is a worldview, perhaps. Who's to say what a worldview is? That is a legitimate question. There are four reasons why I think we must be discouraged from taking this very real evidence that language influences thought and making it into an idea that everybody speaking the world 6,000 different languages is walking around with a different pair of glasses on. That idea seems so benign. It seems cool. It does. It's dangerous. These are the reasons why. First of all, it's not true. Language features do not correlate with what their speakers are like in the ways that we would prefer. Lines hitting a wall, oh, all right. But that's not what these newspaper articles and best-selling books are about. The idea is things that are more romantic than that. Now, look at one language that doesn't have a future marker, and you might think, well, OK, these people aren't very futury. And that's the best you can do. You're a journalist. You flew to Tierra del Fuego. There's only so much you can do. But if you happen to be a linguist, and that's you. Lord forbid too many people choose to do that, but if you happen to be a linguist and you know about, you don't speak them, but if you know about a whole lot of languages, then Orpheanism ends up looking different. This is the sort of thing I mean. It starts with something cool, but then you have to be careful. Amazon, Tuyuka, is one of many, many utterly fascinating languages that are spoken there. I, you know, I, I know technically I should stop favoring that one, and I should go like this, <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't feel right like playing the piano with your hands crossed. So I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so if you are in the Amazon and there's this Tuyuka language, it's spoken by a small group of people. The way their language works, we would never think of it from English. They have something. Well, no, let's not call it anything, because then people get hung up on the, the word for it. Look at what it does. If you're talking about chopping trees, and you say, well, he's chopping trees, and it's based on the fact that you were walking along, hunting, trying to get an anteater or something, and you heard a kind of, so you heard it. Well, you have to put that suffix on. Happens to be he. Obviously, he is chopping trees is not that sentence in Tuyuka. It's not to be unclear. You can imagine it in Tuyuka, you can imagine it would be some to us opaque sentence, and then you put he at the end. If you actually saw it, then you put e at the end. If it's the it's something that you kind of get the feeling based on the fact that you keep finding these trees that are down and you didn't do it, well, then hoy. If it's hearsay, then it's you get it. And then, as you can imagine, there are others, and some of them vary by gender. A man will use one, a woman will use another one. And most of the point, a sentence is incomplete without those. If you don't tack that on, you're either a foreigner or a child. If you're talking about something, you have to specify where you got the information. Those are called evidential markers but more to the point is what they do. Now, evidential markers are found in many languages of the world. It's not just these Amazonians. Actually, Turkish has a dusting of that. Now, you look at the evidential markers, and based on the language's thought hypothesis, we're told to think that that means that the Tuyuka are more sensitive to sources of information than we are. We figure we've got the present, past, and future, they have to do this. That must mean, given that they live on the land, subsistence, economy, it must be that in order to 
know where the birds are and the proper berries and everything that is life there. You need to have developed this sensitivity to sources of information. And that's quite reasonable, and I will even say that in the Amazon, one part of the Amazon, things like this are especially common. They have a lot of these evidential markers. So it means that the evidential <coughs> markers are cultural, and there are many people who will swear to you these things are cultural. When you find these features in a language, it's culture. And you know, we like the word culture. It has a narcotic effect. It's like saying the word muffin. <laughs> Feel it? <laughs> so if somebody says the markers are cultural, they're not just saying a word, they're doing something. It's kind of like, if I make any point and I go like this, then I seem correct. Notice how if anybody does that, that seems like it signifies that something is being said that's valid. But I could say, no, no two plus two is five. And you're thinking, yeah, it must be. Same thing with saying the word culture in many contexts. But it doesn't, doesn't really make sense. If you look at where the evidential markers are in the whole world, it just doesn't make sense. So Europe, it's a continent. It's got languages on it. And a whole bunch of them. So I guess in Europe, the people who are the most sensitive to sources of information are going to have evidential markers. So the ones who are most skeptical, well, guess who has them? Bulgarians. Yeah. Ever met any Bulgarians? I actually have some very close friends who are Bulgarian. Yes, they're kind of skeptical, but I certainly wouldn't say they are the most sensitive people to sources of information <laughs> in Europe as they're sitting there drinking their beer and you know, talking about Bulgaria. Um, Macedonian is really the same language. And they're not especially skeptical either. I met one. He was many things. He was not particularly sensitive to his environment at all. So why not Greeks? They might be kind of skeptical. Greek philosophy, it seemed kind of skeptical to me. No. Are the French not skeptical? See, it doesn't make any sense at all. Or Native American languages. So if you're thinking, well, it has to be something tribal. They have to be living on the land. There can't be evidential markers if you have any tall buildings. Now that's weak enough, but let's say that somehow it's indigenous. Well, Native American languages. They're much more common in the West. You almost never find any in the Native American languages of the East. What is so challenging about the Bay Area that you have to have evidential markers? What a beautiful sunset, but I hear that it might get to be 45 degrees at some point as opposed to in the Northeast where it's cold and there are bears and you starve. But for some reason, those Native Americans didn't need any evidential, it just doesn't make sense. Or, finally, if you look at evidential markers around the world, no evidential markers in Africa. I can think of one language, somebody else can probably think of two. They're not in Polynesia. You're on an island the size of this table, there's breadfruit and a duck. Wouldn't you want to be sensitive to sources of information? <laughs> Apparently not. And if you think about it, sensitive to sources of information is really a way of saying smart. Really, if you're skeptical, it means that you've got something called Homo sapiens' intelligence. What are we saying about these people in Polynesia? What are we saying about the people in Africa? Well, whatever we're saying, it's tempting to then think, well, the evidential markers couldn't have anything to do with thought. But if that's true, then that has to be true even when we're trying to link something attractive to a group of people, because it always comes out like that. The correlations don't ever make any sense in the world. So the Coescar don't have a future. Therefore, it must be because they're in canoes. All right, but if you look at the world and you look at what languages don't have a future marker, it's not about canoes. A lot of it is about accident. Reason number two. Often there's a cart before the horse aspect to this. And so we're taught that it's the language influencing thought. But really, it's that the thought or the surrounding conditions are influencing the language. Now, of course, that can happen. Why would it not? But that's not, well, the grammar of my language and how it organizes words is making me think in a certain way. It's the other way around, which is much more intuitive. And so, for example, it's often said that the Inuit have more words for snow than we do. It's not 300, but they do have more words than just snow, sleet, slush, and a couple of others. 
Now, you're often told, do you know that those people have X numbers of words for snow? So their language makes them distinguish this kind of sleep from that kind of sleep. Isn't that interesting? But the thing is, they live in snow. I mean, it's in their shoes. That's their whole life. So naturally, they need to think about different kinds of it more than we do, except over the past two winters in this city. <laughs> but they, their lives are always like that. So of course, they're going to distinguish. Now that makes sense. Yeah, they've got lots of snowishness, and so they're going to have different words for it. But not that their language channels them into thinking. Now, of course, many people would say, well, couldn't it go both ways? And so of course, they have the snow, and it gives them lots of words for it, and then they've got all these words for it, and that makes them perceive more kinds of snow, and then this is what happens. But why? Why do you, why do you need that? It's that you see a lot of different kinds of snow, and those are the words. You don't need a feedback loop. It's right there. It's still snowing. You see cases like that often. Now this, this is the cool one, but I think that Steve Levinson has it backwards. There are groups in Australia where, and this is really, it's very interesting. It's not that I'm going to say that this is in front of me and this is in back of me. And then when I turn here, I'm going to say this is in front of me and this is in back of me. Nothing could seem more natural. But in many languages of Australia, you talk about north, south, west, and east, the actual north, south, west, and east. And so I don't, in this building, I don't know where I am. Let's say that this is north, and so I'm looking at north, and let's say that that is south. If I turn around, and I'm that kind of Australian, I'd say that's north, and this is south, and I never refer to anything as being in front of or in back of. I always say north, south, no matter how I'm turned. If I'm in the dark, I can keep up with it. You can make these people dizzy, and they still, north. They always know, no matter how they turn, north. It's not that it's to my side, they barely have a word for that. That is the way many people in Australia process direction. And there's a literature that says their language makes them process things that way because they have words for north and south and west and east instead of in front of and behind. But the problem is, it's also that their lives make them process it that way because they live on flat land. And so if you live somewhere that's very flat, not flat like Nebraska, but if you live flat where there really aren't very many landmarks, then of course it would be adaptive to have a very strong sense of north, south, west, and east, rather than in front of and in back of. There's no recorded language that does this that isn't spoken somewhere where things are very flat. There's no rainforest people who say north, south, west, and east instead of in front of, because there are all these trees and, and parrots. There are no people who live where there are a lot of huts and buildings where they talk about west, east. You say over in that building. It's only when it's flat. And with these people, as soon as you move them into the city, for better or for worse, often for worse, they stop the north and the south, and they start saying to the side and to the front. So it's cultural, fascinating in itself, but the idea that this language makes them do that, and saying that about people that are standing on this flat land where there's one rock here and a very small kangaroo over there that doesn't really want to sit still. Well, no, it's the culture that does it. So culture's good, but it's not that the language is what makes them do it. You find one example of that after another, where it's not that the language does it, it's that their life does it, which is interesting enough, but you don't need to come with this magic about the grammar channeling their thoughts. Now, reason number three is where things get more dangerous and also more awkward for me because it involves a language that it seems everybody speaks Chinese but me. It's gotten to that point, even people who weren't born in China. Everybody knows it. I am trying to teach it to myself lately, and it's really, really hard and I can't pronounce it properly. But Chinese really is important to this point, which is that if Warfianism is correct, then there are an awful lot of things in a language that trash innocent people. The language of thought hypothesis can be so unintentionally brutal. So, for example, 
Mandarin Chinese. A lot of context. If you learn Chinese from English, then one of the first things you have to get adjusted to is how much you don't have to say. Languages differ in that way. English is about in the middle. In a lot of Native American languages, you have to say every little thing. How things are shaped. There are languages where you have to specify what time of day something happened. English is about normal. There are other languages where they're very telegraphic, because frankly, all languages say a lot more than you need to. English would get along perfectly well if there was no difference between he, she, and it. We know it because most languages make no such distinction. You just have one thing. Chinese, ta, does just fine. It doesn't matter that it's written different ways according to he, she, and it. In terms of speaking, ta. And nobody misunderstands. Do you mean her? It's just there because we're all in a context. So, some languages are very telegraphic. Chinese. If you see my sister, you'll know that she's pregnant. That's a sentence. There it is. There are the words. I'm not going to read it. You can see. If you see your eye, I, sister, you certainly know she's pregnant. Look. Doesn't really mean now, but we're not going to talk about it because it's complicated and it hurts me. Anyway, so if you see my sister, you know she's pregnant. Okay, what kind of sentence is that? I don't know. But if you also said, if you saw my sister, you'd have known she was pregnant. If you had seen my sister, you would have known she was pregnant. All those sentences can be said in this way. Now, if you really, if somebody puts a pop gun to your head and you have to convey exactly if you had seen my sister, you would have known that she was pregnant. You can, if you've got a lot of time and if somebody's really not too quick on the uptake. But really, the way it would be said if you're walking down the streets of Beijing and somebody says this, chewing gum, it's that. You don't need to specify all of those issues of the counterfactual in this language. Chinese is extremely telegraphic. I don't remember what the next card is. Oh, well, that's sorry. So, telegraphic. Now, let's take the Worfianism paradigm to where it's supposed to go. If in Chinese, and all of the Chinese languages operate in this way, if the Chinese don't have to say so very much, of what we do. And this kind of thing goes on and on. Indicating the plural in Chinese is highly optional compared to in English. You have to get used to how telegraphic it is. If they don't have to say as much as an English speaker does, and your grammar channels your thoughts, then doesn't that mean that speak Chinese means that you're not really thinking as much? And we don't want to think about it, but that's what one would have to think, and somebody did. In 1980, there was a psychologist, perfectly, he wore suits, he had tenure, and he decided that he was going to study. Now, of course, he was a good person. It's not he wasn't going to study whether to be Chinese is to be stupid. But he wanted to study whether, if you are a speaker of Mandarin, you are less sensitive to counterfactuality, such as if you had seen as opposed to you did see than speakers of a language like English, where, as it happens, you have to mark those sorts of things more consistently. He wanted to see. And he found, and he examined a great many Chinese speakers and a great many English speakers, that, yeah, if you present Mandarin Chinese speakers with various scenarios that involve counterfactuals, they are significantly less nimble at processing such things than English speakers. And he said, well, this must be because of the structure of Chinese. Now, of course, we're talking about relatively small differentials, and so he certainly didn't mean to insult anybody, but that's what he said. There was a long battle in the literature, and some people said, well, that you have to take into account what questions like this mean in Chinese culture, and people went back and forth. He had his responses. It was all kind of messy, and if you weren't in the battle, and you just look at the smoking heap, of all of the responses, he kind of came out at a draw. Really, the Chinese speakers weren't as good at those things, and it wasn't all culture. And, you know, if you see something like that, it's so obvious 
that the Chinese are not operating at some kind of cognitive deficit. But I think any reasonable person looks at experiments like that and just says, well, these tiny differentials must not have anything to do with culture or psychology or thought patterns. Certainly, a person who speaks Mandarin Chinese walks through the world and processes that which is real and that which isn't every bit as vividly and fluently as the rest of us. There is no evidence whatsoever that they don't. Okay, but if that's the verdict on something like Mandarin Chinese, then we have to apply that verdict to the things that seem cooler, such as somebody who perhaps doesn't know anything about the future because they're so romantically focused on the present or something like that. Or it means that if this sort of thing doesn't qualify as a world view, then neither does the experiment with the filling up of the squares or the experiment with the Nivea. It means that we're talking about tiny psychological differences that don't have anything to do with personhood. They don't have to do with channeling your thoughts about the world. Here's another example. The Manambu um, are way down in New Guinea, on the island of New Guinea. They're a small group of people. They speak a language. It's called Manambu. Now, look at those three sentences. I'm drinking water, I'm eating food, I'm smoking. Now, you see that there are three, this is like being Linguistics 101, you see that there are three words that are different Okay, and they probably correspond to either the drinking and the eating or the smoking, or the water and the food and the tobacco. <laughs> because these words are all the same. No, all the same. Now you know that this is not going to be a culture where there's no difference between water and food and tobacco. They're going to have something that means just water. So what's all the same? Well, it can't be the I, because then something's missing. It's that they only have one word that means eat, drink, or smoke. Put it in your mouth and it disappears, that's one word. You could say that that word translates as ingest, but you know, we don't use the word ingest. You don't ingest your Marlboro Light. And that's all they have. There is no word for drinking. It's just all the same thing. Now. What does that say about these people? So it's one thing to say, well, God, they see snow in this kaleidoscopic acid trip way. And so that makes you like the Inuit. Okay, well, what about them? So apparently for them, you're chewing on some meat, you're drinking some water, you're puffing on your cigarette. It's all just the same thing. They must be pretty crude. I mean, they don't seem like the most delicate <coughs> of people. It seems like they just kind of go around. And you know, if you study the Manambu, I'm making it sound like I have. Let me pretend I have. If you do five years of field work among the Manambu, <laughs> such as I did, or if you take a quick look at work that people actually have done, you found that they are. You find they are very much into the subtle distinctions in their cuisine, and their work has nothing to do with them. It's just an accident in the language. You find that again and again, where you see things in a language that make the people look bad. And so it's not always a matter of, ooh, snow. Oh, they get dizzy and they know where West is. Sometimes it's, oh, they must not be very quick on the uptake. Or, oh, they just snarf their food and their drink and their tobacco in one big bowl and they don't care. <laughs> now with Manahambu, we look at it and we think, well, that couldn't have anything to do with them. Uh, the whole Orphean paradigm ends up submitting to that. And finally, let's look at ourselves. Let's take the... I'm so bad at analogy sometimes, especially when it involves my body below my neck. But let's take the telescope and turn it around, and let's look at ourselves. What's the worldview from English? Notice how in your brain it kind of went, ah! and that's not what you expect to be asked. Worldview from Inuit? Sure. Worldview from Chinese? A little odd, especially because in our lives we know so many Chinese speakers, and you can just kind of tell that all of them don't have any worldview. But what about us, English speakers? What's the world view? You have to think about what that would mean. Here are some people who <laughs> speak English. Mayor Jonathan Moore, Sting, he does. William Jennings Bryan was a great orator. You can hear him online. He makes his cross of gold speech. He's speaking English. He's dead, but he spoke English. 
Margaret Cho grew up speaking English. She did not grow up speaking only Korean. Charlie Chaplin, you don't hear him do it much because of the nature of his work. But he spoke English. Lena Dunham and Charlie Chaplin speak the same language. And I would guess that at least half of us grew up speaking English. Mary Tyler Moore, Lena Dunham, William Jennings Bryan, Sting. What's the world view? I mean, you can tell that there really isn't anything. Now, you can take away maybe William Jennings Bryan and Charlie Chaplin. Maybe the world has changed. But still, Mary Tyler Moore is kind of alive. And Sting, Margaret Cho, <laughs> Lena Dunham is probably in some cafe in Chelsea right now. And I presume that all of you are alive and speaking the same language. What's the worldview? Obviously, all of those people have very different worldviews. If there's a worldview from the language that all of those people speak or have spoke, how significant was it? So it's one thing to say, well, the Manambu have a worldview. And you can tell because of their verbs, damn it. OK, but what about, what about English? I'm talking right now. Am I speaking in a worldview based on how my verbs work? For example, there is one language in the world where in the present tense conjugation, you have a marker only in the third person singular. It's English. I walk, you walk, he, she, it walks, we walk, y'all walk, they walk. We're so used to it, that's really odd. There's no other language in the world known where there's only one marker and it's on the third person singular for God knows what reason. If you are only going to have one marker, it's not supposed to be there. Now, if we were, English speakers were living in some glade, I imagine people might come and say, well, look at that third person singular. That must mean that there's something third person singular about them. But I think that we know that it's just a little Philip. I mean, not P-H, I mean, F-I-L-L-I-P. It's just a little Philip, a little bag of shells, as Jackie Gleason used to say on the Honeymooners. It's like soup. Languages are like soup, and they are. What I mean by that is all languages are much more complex and specific than they need to be in some way. He and she is overdoing it in English, for example. All languages overdo it in some ways, and you don't really know in what way. If you're studying languages around the world, you're waiting to see what it, linguists often say this, what it does. And you'll find out that this unknown language, oh, it does evidentials. Oh, it does this, it does that. That's how it's talked about. It's almost like how a sporting event is going to come out. But it's just chance. You can't know what it's going to be. It's not connected to anything psychologically specific or cultural. The analogy is with soup oh, if you cook and you've got some mess in there, and the fire is going, well, pretty soon a bubble's going to come up. It's not going to be right in the middle. It's going to be over there, or there, or here, or there. Where's the net? You, you can't know. Chaos theory, there are scientists who could teach you a lot, but after they were finished teaching you, they couldn't predict anything. It's just a soup bubble. All languages have their different soup bubbles. So, who cares? Why is this so important? I did a media interview on this, and the interviewer said, why is this eating your trash, John McWhorter? You shouldn't care about this. I, I care. And this, this is why. One, it's just not true. It's just, you hear about it all the time. There are these books, The Language Miracle. We must save languages because they channel the speaker's views, because this language has words for hanging vines, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not true. And so if you happen to be a language person, it's like being, it's like being a paleontologist and seeing people saying, well, Tyrannosaurus lived alongside groups of human beings, and some of them were taken on as pets. And you just think, no, they weren't. And people keep on saying that and going like this when you object. It's just not true. Two, it's dangerous Chinese. Really? Whole series of articles. Chinese are not sensitive to the counterfactual. That's what Warfianism means. It's dangerous. For everything that looks cool, dizzy people who know where West is, that's cool. There's something else that makes the people look like idiots. You can go all through the world, and you can think, well, that, in that language, if they have this, it means that they must be quite warlike. If they don't have this, it must mean that they don't see plurality as much as we do. And so there are four goats walking by. 
And according to the Morphean paradigm, some people are just thinking, ah, goats, whereas I'm thinking, oh, four of them. No, you know, because that's basically calling them a dirty name. It's condescending, really. Let's say, and I'm not taking on Jack Hitt, the journalist. It was a random thing in his work. I don't know who he is. But you're looking at a group of people, and they don't happen to have a way of marking the future in their language as regularly as we do. Like Chinese, well, Coescar is another one of those languages. And you say, well, they don't have the future because they're so busy traveling in their canoes that they don't have time to think about the future. That's not a compliment. I mean, the idea is supposed to be that well, they're in the moment, whereas we're always <laughs> thinking about the past and the future when we go into therapy, etc. But no, <laughs> we are very proud of ourselves for thinking about the future. Tonight, I know what I'm doing. I'm thinking about it a little bit. I'm never completely in the present, and I like it. Well, I think we all feel that way. And to pretend that we think of that as wonderful, or, oh wow, they're very sensitive to sources of information, as, as if we're not. I mean, do you really walk down Broadway not sensitive? And so there's a bus that goes beep, you turn around, you see somebody coming who's looking a little off, you don't walk up and shake their hand, you know where food is cheaper and where food is more expensive. We're very sensitive to our environment. I went and um, my hair was wet when I came here, and since there was a little bit of weight at the beginning, I had to go find the bathroom so I could wipe my hair. Those of you who are familiar with this building know that it was quite an adventure <laughs> finding that bathroom. I went up steps, I went down them, and then up some others. And I finally found that bathroom, and I did make my way back here because I was sensitive to my environment. That is how we are. I wasn't catching a parrot because I can buy chicken at the store. But we are not really giving anybody a compliment in that way. What we're doing is we're trying to show that we understand that people who live in cultures that are quote unquote not as developed as ours are human beings with advanced cognition as well. That is a very important thing to do. But you can do it in different ways than a false paradigm about how language works. So, are people different? Of course, culture demonstrates it. My message is not that people are not different and that we're all the same. Culture demonstrates our diversity, but really language, if it demonstrates anything, demonstrates our similarities. And both of those things are worth celebration. The fact that your language can do any old thing, and yet it can work upon the same basic cognition that all people have, is a marvelous thing. Your language can say very little or say too much, and it leaves you the same basic person manipulating and managing their way through life. Now, there are huge differences between cultures. They are there. Odd thing is, they don't correlate with language. One of the funniest things about Morphianism is that a person will often say a language evolves according to its speaker's needs. And you know what? It doesn't. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>